So good morning, everyone. Um, this morning we have Heidi Roop with us from the CIG. Uh, she's going to present uh, about climate change and communication this morning. And I have a brief introduction for Heidi here. Heidi is a climate scientist with a passion for science and communication. She is the lead scientist for science communication at the UW Climate Impacts Group and an affiliate assistant professor in the UW Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. Heidi works to understand how to effectively connect science to decision making in support of climate resilience. Her scientific career has led her to all seven continents where she has participated in research from Alaska and Antarctica to the mountains of Vietnam and New Zealand. Heidi was a physical scientist with the United States Geological Survey in Colorado and has developed numerous education and communication product, pro, products for NASA, the National Science Foundation, GNS Science, and the Exploratorium. So we're really excited to have Heidi here with us today. And um, we will, I will monitor your questions and we can ask questions at the end. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Heidi now. Is Heidi with us? I am, but I am having technical difficulties. Um, I'm not sure you'll be able to record my presentation unless I quit and come back. Um, so let me know what you prefer me to do. So I'm gonna defer that to Alicia or Jan. Well, Heidi, I think we can see, I can see your screen yeah. now and we can hear you fine. So I, th I think we are good to go forward. Okay. Um, yep. Hopefully it records. Um, if not, we can um, come up with a solution after. Um, all right. I think we're ready. So let me know, uh, maybe raise your hand or you can, uh, moderators can flag for me if there are any audio um, issues. All right, all, it's lovely to meet with you virtually this morning and I appreciate the invitation um, to share some thoughts and insights that I hope you'll find useful in both your professional and personal lives when it comes to communicating about climate change and engaging more people in this increasingly important conversation about what our future holds for us as we continue to warm the planet. Um, I will be speaking after this about the climate impacts in the Pacific Northwest and what we've observed and what we anticipate um, to come towards the end of the century based on uh, research at the Climate Impacts Group. So if you're looking for specific information about our region, um, stick around for the presentation following this one. Um, so I have already had a wonderful introduction, so I won't uh, belabor the point, but I am an earth scientist by training um, who really became frustrated with um, the work I was doing and, and the lack of connection of that work to um, decisions and places and spaces that I felt like mattered. So I've had the privilege of having a rich scientific career, understanding how the Earth's climate system has been changing um, by using past archives of climate, like lake sediments and ice cores, um, and looking at how our mountain regions are changing, how our water quality is changing. Um, and Throughout all this research, I continue to want to connect this more meaningfully to community um, and to policy. And so I luckily found myself um, hired at the Climate Impacts Group at the University of Washington. We're a small research group of about 15 people uh, working to make global climate science locally relevant. Um, and so um, we've likely collaborated with some of you on this call. I can't see all of the names, um, but are really working in support of developing um, useful um, and used climate science for a range of decisions and contexts across the Pacific Northwest. So um, rather than chasing the most interesting scientific question, um, we're often trying to generate the most useful climate change information to support our state agencies, 
tribes, tribal members, communities, um, and others working to shape uh, our, our society, basically all the things we rely on. Climate change underpins uh, much of what we take advantage on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we are working to help um, build out those connections for climate smart decision-making. Um, but that involves effective communication and understanding people's concerns, their needs, their knowledge gaps, where they need capacity built out in order to build climate resilience. So before I launch into a content-rich um, presentation, and hopefully there'll be an opportunity for discussion, and I'm always happy to have discussions offline, um, I just wanted us to take a minute and for everyone to take a bit of a breath. Um, and I find this particular image from NASA very powerful. Um, this is our home. This is where we live. This is what supports our life. Um, we're living in a very tumultuous world right now. Um, and climate change is adding um, to that. And it's a por par important part of conversations that are happening now. Um, but I want to just take a minute for everyone to just take a few beats and look at this image and just sort of feel all the things you may be feeling, whether those are hope, or hopelessness or fear or excitement, um, whatever that is, I just want you to hold space as we have a conversation about how we are profoundly changing this place we call home. Okay, I find this photo I often have to come back to this working in climate change and climate change communication. Uh, people always ask me if I, you know, where I find hope or um, if I get depressed and I guess the answer is yes. And I do find hope and I'm, I'm hopeful that I can um, help you think about those stories of hope and action um, and change today when we think about how it is we, we can bring more people into the conversation around climate change and why it matters. So just to get a feel for who's on this call, or if you don't want to type this in the chat box, that's totally fine. Um, but the question is, who do you typically engage with in conversations about climate change? It might be that you don't engage in any conversations with climate change for a range of reasons, and that's completely valid. But um, if you want to type in the chat box, if you feel like you have an audience or someone in mind, um, that would help me. And I think it's also good uh, to get the juices flowing when we're talking about how it is we talk about climate change, to think about who it is that we often talk to, um, and maybe we can identify where there are gaps, who isn't part of the conversations um, that we maybe want to bring into the fold. So if anyone wants to add in the chat box, that would be great. I see family, yeah, I coworkers. Oh, go ahead, Carrie. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I just, can you see those um, yeah. questions? Yep. Yeah, I, okay. I see one popping up. Okay, I see community organizers, local government, family, coworkers, landowners, friends. There might be a bit of a delay on my end, but that's a good smattering so far. Um, so I'll move on in the interest of time, but as we go through this, just think about who it is that you engage with or maybe who it is you might like to start engaging with in conversations about climate change. And so my next question, and again, you can share or not, um, is what do you find difficult about climate change communication? Um, what are some of the difficulties that you face? Um, some of these might be your own um, insecurity and in, in knowing what, what matters or knowing the science. It might be how political the issue is. And feel free to chat, um, type in the chat box as well. And Carrie, if you see those coming up more quickly than I do, that would be great if you could read them out. Yeah, so I see word and phrase stigmatization. Yeah, we have some other ones here. There's um, deniers, misinformation, um, political polarization. Um, helping people plan for it when they don't believe in it. Um, topic can be very divided. 
I'm not. Yeah, I can only see comments from our from our staff, these five staff. So I can't see attendees comments. Just FYI. And maybe Heidi, yeah. that might be. I'm having the same well. issue. Yeah. 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 So I, I can help read those. And those are some of the ones I just said. Um, OK. And some others kind of along that same vein. OK, great. Well, we will talk about a few of those um, in this presentation. So. Um, Excellent, thank you for contributing there. I know it's a, always a little difficult on these platforms. Um, so climate change communication is challenging. As you noted, I think we sort of actually captured a lot of these um, challenges that we can face when, when we endeavor to have di build dialogue around climate change and that it's a complex issue. So it's a wicked problem. There isn't a one size fits all solution. Um, there's often a lack of understanding, uh, maybe about what ca is causing it, more importantly, why it matters. Um, there are often psychological and ideological barriers. So these are all very well documented um, challenges that we can face. Climate risks often appear distant and exaggerated. This is a problem for the future, not a problem for today. The scale of the issue is often used to rationalize inaction. We're asking people to plan for and incorporate uncertainty in ways that they haven't necessarily been trained to or that they're not comfortable with. Um, we're asking for use of new approaches and sometimes new data sets and different types of data, different types of knowledge. Um, we're asking people to look at the world in a different way. And oftentimes, um, having these conversations or acting on climate change science and climate change information can be associated with political, social, and financial costs. Um, so this is to frame the challenge. I think um, the good thing is, our, is that there are ways to overcome all of these things, and there are increasingly more and more people working to understand how it is that we address these issues and these challenges within different contexts. So within agencies or uh, policy making, um, within communities. And so I, I find hope in that while we're outlining a, a range of challenges that we can face, um, I think increasingly we're seeing people overcome these barriers and identify effective ways for doing so. So how we feel climate change depends on how we act now to reduce our emissions. And I'll give you a bit more context if you stick around in the following talk, what that actually means and how much we're talking about. So reducing our emissions, this is often referred to as mitigation and how well we prepare our communities and the systems we rely on. This is adaptation. So this idea of prevention and preparation are kind of the two parts of the equation that we need to consider when we think about how we will feel climate change, which can inform how we talk about climate change, because people often want to know what is it that we do or why do my actions matter? So greenhouse gas emissions, excuse the typo, um, determine temperature rise. This is a figure from the National Climate Assessment produced in 2018 showing temperature change in Fahrenheit um, out to the year 2100. So the green line and the black line represent observed changes with the black line being a model that is well um, reproducing well our observed change in temperature. And the red line and the blue lines are showing us different pathways depending on our emission. These are emission scenarios that are produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The red is showing us a high emission scenario and the blue is showing us a low or significantly reduced um, trajectory than what we are currently on for our emissions. And you can see that the spread between these two different pathways is quite different. We're looking at something like if we reduce our emissions drastically and get on RCP 2.6, um, we could limit our warming out at the end of the century to just over two degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if we stay on a business as usual, that, that term is going out of style um, these days, but if we go on a high emissions pathway or trajectory, um, we can see that, that that temperature is gonna be in excess of eight degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so we, we have a range of possible futures that we could face depending on what it is we choose to do with our emissions. I think it's important to note when we start talking about climate change is that people really like to lean on the uncertainty of the science or the uncertainty in the models. And those different trajectories, there are certainly uncertainty associated with the, our ensembles of global climate models. But the greatest source of uncertainty about what the future holds is actually societal action and behavior change. It is impossible for us to, with confidence, predict what it is that global society is going to do in regards to our emissions. And so 
a huge amount of the uncertainty is actually captured in human behavior. This is not uncertain from different from other types of uncertainty that we we inter, we interact with on a day to day basis, like the stock market or our retirement accounts, uh, population planning, and something like a water utility. These are all types of uncertainty that are actually really hard to constrain. And so people like to lean on the global climate models as being the source of the uncertainty, when in reality it's really that we just don't understand what it is we can do. So there is obviously always going to be uncertainty in um, our global climate models, but the, diff the range in, very, uh, in range of possible futures is really um, based on not fully understanding what global society will choose to do. Um, so I'm gonna just assume that we're all in the same point here and that the science is clear. We understand that as we emit more greenhouse gases through the combustion of things like fossil fuels, um, we raise the global temperature. That in turn, that global warming in turn translates to impacts on um, our lives and our landscapes that matter. And so the question is, how is it we move forward the conversation to say, achieve a lower emissions trajectory and get off the high emissions trajectory? That is right, the, one of the ultimate questions around climate change communication is how is it that we change behavior and change our systems in a way um, to not only make them more climate resilient, but to have less of a negative impact um, on climate through reducing emissions. So the good news, and I'm, I'm giving you this all in hopes that um, this provides you with fodder and hope for your own conversations, whether those are professional or, uh, or personal conversations you have around climate change. Um, contrary to what many people think, a majority of Americans say climate change is happening. So 71%, uh, this is a poll from 2019, say climate change is happening, and only 9% say it's not happening. 19% um, say they're unsure, and we'll unpack that a little bit and see that as, um, rather than a disappointing thing, a, a really important opportunity for climate change communicators. 70% of adults in Washington say climate change is happening, so we're lock and step with the national average. Um, this is from the Yale Center for Climate Change Communication. They have climate opinion polling, um, these climate opinion maps with a range of questions. I highly encourage you to check them out, especially if you're interested in how your county um, is, is thinking about both um, climate change and whether it's happening or not, but how much buy-in there is for alternatives, for different solutions like support for renewable energy use. When we think about um, having conversations about climate change. So often, I think this came up too, we're thinking about how do you talk to deniers, people who are unsure, they don't believe in it. Um, our goal is never to convince people that it's real. We want to share information and build dialogue around the issue, um, but more often than not, I think we want to try to focus on deniers um, because there's a perception that they're numerous um, and they also have a, often a loud voice or a bigger platform than say people who are concerned about climate change, but unsure about what to do. Um, so I, I'm gonna give you some statistics here um, about the American population and show you how deniers actually make up an incredible minority um, of, of American public perception of, of climate change. Um, and importantly, it can hopefully help us think about shifting our focus away from those few that we're, we're never going to shift um, towards having an effective conversation with about climate change, but instead think about the people who are sitting in the middle who are eager for information and wanna learn more. So Yale, um, it also did some surveying and, and did some research and divided America into these global warming six Americas. And this is um, this is how they've drawn them out in a cartoon, um, ranging from alarmed, which is someone who's sort of watching the news unfold and saying, we have a global climate crisis um, and we all must do something now to that dismissive or often referred to as denier category, um, which is sort of sits in this climate change as a hoax or a conspiracy uh, bucket. And But in between, there are folks who are doubtful, they're disengaged, they're cautious, they're concerned, they're not necessarily um, eager to act, but often looking for information to fill in what they acknowledge are knowledge gaps. Um, so this is looking at a November 2019 survey um, showing us the population, the percentage of um, the American population that falls into the Global Warming Six Americas. And you can see that when we look at the those with the highest belief in global warming, the most concerned and those most motivated, that alarmed, that concerned and that cautious category, that's 73% of the American population. 
those who fall in that dismissive or doubtful category are, are really a minority. And so I think when we are talking, entering these conversations, we really need to um, think about the spectrum that people might fall on in terms of their concern, um, their motivation to do something, or just their understanding of the issue at hand. So less than one in 10 people fall in that dismissive group. Um, like I said, they're characteristically loud um, and, and have a platform. And so I think the perception is that there are far more people who fall in that dismissive category um, than there are in reality. 72% um, of Americans are already engaged, curious, and they want to learn more. And therein lies our opportunity. That's a significant majority of people who maybe just want more information or want to enter into a conversation in a way that is non-threatening and that avoids some of these um, classic challenges, the sort of confrontation that can um, often frame our conversations um, when we think about it of someone, whether you believe it or not, when we make it ideological rather than something about, say, let's, let's work to shape our collective future together. What are our values? What do we care about? What are our mutual um, concerns? So um, nearly six in 10 Americans are now either alarmed or concerned about global warming. So um, this, is, this is changing rapidly over time. So we see more and more people um, falling toward this, this uh, end of the spectrum. And from 2014 to 2019, that alarmed category nearly tripled. That's incredible over such a short period of time. And so some of the work that we're doing is working. And now the, the challenge is changing this alarm into productive and effective action, both in that preparation and that prevention piece. So these are the fastest growing segments in the US, they continue to be so, and this is our opportunity. And so that we need to connect this momentum to action. And so what about these psychological and ideological barriers? You guys noted these um, in the things that you find challenging about climate change communication. I am not going to pretend that they don't exist. This is a poll from um, the Associated Press in 2019 um, showing um, beliefs um, based on, on party affiliation and that climate change is happening. Um, I still think that um, despite the partisan nature of the issue, um, we still are um, in some cases overweighting um, the minority who are behaving in a partisan way um, and trying to tank the conversation versus the, the majority who are sitting in the middle um, needing an opportunity to engage in meaningful conversation and to, to take some of the partisanship out of it. So I'm not going to pretend that it's a, it's a non-partisan, you know, that this isn't a partisan issue. It certainly is. Um, so that is a challenge that we face, but I think it's not a barrier we can't overcome. And we do see that people don't really want to pay for dealing with the issue. And so this was a um, poll that looked at people's support for paying a monthly fee to help deal with climate change. And this was, um, you can see that uh, quite a few people wanted to, were willing to pay a dollar. Um, fewer were willing to pay $10. Um, and that $40, you can see that many, many people were against paying a fee. And so there's still, um, and I think we could unpack this as to why, um, but I think there's still um, a disconnect between um, what it will take to address climate change and what we're willing to do. And I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that individuals need to pay for the solutions, um, but this just gives you a sense of um, when we get beyond the conversation about belief um, to solutions, um, that is where it becomes trickier thinking about how it is that we actually fund or support or do this work through policy actions or things like fees. I'm not advocating for one or the other, um, but this just gives you a sense of, of one of the challenges in when we think about solutions. So I have another question for you, which is how many of you talk about climate change with specifically with your family and your friends? I'm, I wish there were like, I guess there's probably a hand raising function. Um, maybe you can just carry, just give me a sense for. I see Jan, it, I do I, constantly. <laughs> yeah, Jan is the one who can see that, I think. Oh, or... sorry, Jan, if you could maybe read out a couple. I see an I yeah. do constantly, but or oh just a God. sense of. A lot of hands raised and. Um... There's yeses and here's and to some degree um, 
at the forefront of conversations, not very often, so kind of a range there. Okay, great. And I think that is um, what I expected, and I think that is great. Um, even just one conversation is progress. Um, so 36% of adults in Washington state discuss climate global warming at least on occasion. So this means that a significant minority of us are actually engaging in conversations on occasion about this issue that I think a lot of people refer to as an existential crisis or the biggest stressor facing our times or the biggest threat we're facing. Um, I think this number gives us an opportunity um, to do better in that only a minority of us in a state where a majority of us think climate that global warming is happening few of us are actually engaging in conversations about it with our family and friends um, and it turns out that most of us trust our family and friends more than we trust other sources of information um, this includes political leaders sometimes faith leaders we often seek out and get information from people who are in our immediate friend and family um, circles and so this is an opportunity to have these conversations and to move this forward because if we don't talk about it, it's not an issue. And this ranges from it's not an issue in people's individual lives through to it's not an, a, not an issue where people might have agency through things like voting. So you might be rolling your eyes and saying, well, is it really as simple as talking about it with my family and friends? And so this is where I'm gonna unpack some of the science of science communication, um, some of the tips and tricks that we know using evidence work for having converse, effective conversations about climate change. And so the pure act of talking about it is a climate action, but how we do it matters. So we know that we want simple, clear messages, and I'll give you some ideas about what those could look like, repeated often, and this is, you know, this isn't just once you've had a conversation, you tick the box and you're done. Um, and they need to be, these, these messages need to be delivered and these conversations need to be had by a variety of trusted voices. And so all of those on this call represent a portion of that variety of trusted voices. Um, we are trusted within our own circles of friends, families, colleagues, and so the pure act of having these conversations more than once using simple, clear language can be an effective way to move the dial. When we think about what it is we're communicating, these conversations we're having, um, this, this content applies, I think, more um, I think you should always consider these things um, when you're going into a conversation, um, in particular one that you anticipate might be a difficult conversation. Um, but this, I think, is particularly true in professional contexts. So if you are going out and communicating about the um, climate change and how it impacts your work or the landscape or conservation action, um, these are, or you're, you're thinking about integrating communications into a project, these are some fundamental things um, that I think we need to articulate and be explicit about when we think about how to be effective messengers of climate change information. So we really need to think about who our audience is. Who needs the information that you are wanting to share? And what is it you're asking people to do? What makes it actionable? And if you're thinking about someone changing their behavior or doing something differently, are the is your audience actually have the authority to make that change? And so these are important things, I think, to unpack, particularly in sort of a group or project-based context. Um, think about your content. What's the best way to deliver that knowledge to the relevant audiences? What's the level of detail, the language, the framing, your shared values? Um, it's not just about the science, and I'll reiterate that in a minute. Um, delivery. Sometimes it's not about you being the messenger, but someone else who might be more trusted in that community or within the audience that you're trying to reach. So doing that work and sometimes being humble enough to acknowledge that you might not actually be the best suited to have this conversation or to build this dialogue. So sometimes it's about stepping back. Plan, do you have sufficient scope, time, budget to deliver information in a desired format? So this is a little bit of my soapbox, but oftentimes this part of work, the communications, the messaging, the engagement, are often the pieces that are last minute on a project or not or underfunded. And so we do need to think about, do we have enough time to do this piece well, to connect what it is we care about or what we're doing or what we're hoping to achieve um, to that action or to that audience, ensuring that we actually have a plan and that that plan is funded. 
And then it's always important to know what success looks like. What does success look like for those involved? That might be on your team, but also your audience. And so these are some key um, fundamental building blocks, I think, for effective communication. And this goes beyond um, climate change as a topic. Um, and I'm happy to share this information if, if it's at all useful to anyone. I can give you these slides. Um, how you talk about the work that you're doing or about climate change matters. Um, for someone like me, it's important to remember it is not all about the science. You'll see in my subsequent presentation that I have a ton of nerdy slides that I think are incredibly compelling about both observed and projected changes in Northwest climate that should get everybody riled up. Um, but for some people, it's not about facts, figures, and the science. And so we often want to start conversations by telling the other person or a group of people everything we know, and then assuming that that knowledge is what they need and it's what they want to know in order to act. Um, we know from the science of science communication um, that this idea, this emphasis on content, often referred to as the deficit model, in that I tell you something and therefore you have gained knowledge, um, is really ineffective, particularly for these controversial issues, where we need to transition to thinking more about not the context and content and the context in which we're having conversations and really work to build in two-way exchange of knowledge. This is how we learn about our audience. This is how we establish common ground. And so this emphasis on dialogue also steps us away from the idea of a one-off conversation being the only tool we need in order to um, inspire behavior change or lead to action. We know that we need to do um, multiple, right? This is repeating our simple, clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted voices or messengers. Um, in there, unpacking that also requires that we think about building dialogue or conversation, where we think about the context in which we're having these conversations. Obviously, it's really important to connect your concerns to local issues. It's one thing to care about a polar bear. It's another thing to care about where your drinking water is coming from or your ability to flush your t uh, to turn on your tap or flush your toilet. A couple of those things will really get us motivated to do something more potentially when we know and can see how the impacts um, of an issue will directly touch us. And there's no question that we are experiencing or that climate change um, will touch and is already starting to touch um, our very own backyard. So one of the things we do at the Climate Impacts Group is really work to take these big global stories like the um, science that comes up from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and, and make it local. So this is a, a graphic um, from a report that I um, helped lead write that came out in January, synthesizing an Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. And this is a, a synthesis of um, information about the global impacts of climate change on our oceans and our cryosphere, so our frozen, the frozen parts of our planet, which would include um, our mountain ranges in Washington State and our glaciers. And we work to understand, well, what does that mean? Um, did the science and synthesize the results that um, my peers and colleagues have generated um, to understand, well, what does it actually mean in our backyard? So this is a schematic, sort of a Mount Rainier-esque situation here, looking at what it actually means in Washington state. Um, you know, I think we care about sea level rise and we're concerned about our global ice sheets, but it's a lot more meaningful if you know that the melting of those global ice sheets translates into direct impacts on the coastlines and maybe the coastal community or your own coastal home that you care about. Making it personal. Um, this is the first time my new daughter has appeared in any of my presentations. This is Abby, she's six months old. Um, and I have a whole new um, reason that I care about today and the future. And so this may seem cliche, but I think it is also really important um, to connect your, your own personal concerns, even in a professional context sometimes, about why you care. Um, I've had many conversations um, with, say, coastal managers um, in, in Washington state, and I start by talking about my connection, my personal connection through my grandfather um, to the ocean and to um, a family home. And that is a really powerful way to have a conversation. It makes me not just a scientist, but a human too. Um, and thinking about how climate change will alter the things you care about. It is not, it is a good technique to think about why you care and make these conversations personal. Um, so my guess, my next question to you is, do you think climate change will harm you personally? This is a yes, no, possibly more complicated question, um, but for the purposes of time, 
uh, maybe just uh, either in the chat box or raise your hand if you personally think climate change will harm you. Okay, looks like we're getting a lot of yeses. Absolutely not seeing any no's here. All yeses. Okay, so you all have a story that you can tell, which is that personal connection. What about climate change matters to you personally? How will it harm you personally? Having these conversations and building this into your dialogue is really important for um, helping people connect to the issue. So only 42% of adults in Washington think global warming will harm them personally. You can see it's fewer in some parts of the state. And so this is, an, this is a great place to have a conversation, which is to talk about why you care and how you think you will feel climate change, or maybe um, what you've experienced that you think is already going to be um, what the future might look like, like say wildfire smoke um, or some of our big um, wildfire seasons like 2015. We expect these things to emerge in the future, say more and bigger wildfire on both the west and the east sides of the Cascades. Um, these are ways that you can start having conversations and help people connect the dots so that we can move this number upwards. It's important to note that we will all experience climate change. There is no question that it will touch at least something in everyone's lives. Um, but even in Washington state, we will not all experience climate change and its impacts equally. Um, this is from a report that uh, the Climate Impacts Group produced with a range of partners, including Front and Centered and the Seattle Foundation and Urban at UW and the School of Public Health at UW looking at um, how the disproportionate risks of climate change facing Washington state communities. I encourage you to take a look. It's um, just an entry point. It's sort of a um, what we know about climate change and the, the connection with equity in our state. Um, and basically, uh, from all the other literature that exists around the world, we know that your vulnerability and exposure, therefore your risks um, to climate change, are really a combination of who you are, where you work, where you live, um, and those all come together to determine the risks you face, but also your ability to bounce back when a negative, um, say, extreme event or something is experienced in our communities. So this is a really important space. We can, can think about these conversations. So I didn't want to um, ignore the fact that um, we will not all experience climate change in the same way. And so that's important to consider when you start to have conversations about what you care about, really understanding how someone else engaging in a conversation or um, getting information from you might be experiencing climate change differently. So what about misinformation and denial? Um, this is a big one. We could do an entire um, week long lecture on this. And so I'm just gonna give you a few resources. Um, this is from my colleague, John Cook at George Mason University. He studies um, the characteristics of science denial and how to overcome science denial. Um, but more often than not, we can unpack very easily um, tactics that are used to um, propagate science denial or that um, are, are often parts of people's misunderstandings about either the consensus around climate change or um, sort of messaging that they might be repeating from places they've heard. We often see fake experts being used. So um, this is one where people say, well, I'm an expert in climate science because I have um, a degree in engineering that's maybe completely unrelated to anything. Like they'll never, never have looked at, say, a data set that engages climate. So claiming expertise um, or varying expertise um, is, a, is a common tactic we see. Logical fallacies are used a lot. We often see cherry picking of data. Um, conspiracy theories is also in there, a key characteristic of science denial. And so um, being aware of these, and I, I encourage you to check out the website Skeptical Science that unpacks the most common uh, misconceptions and talking points, denial-based talking points around climate change. It unpacks what's true or not, or which one of these tools is being used um, to cast doubt on information that's being shared. Um, the golden rule of debunking, right? We're not convincing people, um, but often people may, someone may repeat back to you something that's inaccurate or be repeating a myth, um, but we have to fight these sticky myths about climate change with stickier facts. And so this comes down to how we message and talk about climate change. Um, 
So this, again, we can unpack this. There's a great booklet on this that I think is um, a good read. It's very graphic driven, again, by John Cook, um, if you're interested particularly in debunking myths around climate change. Uh, we know that consensus language works. A lot of people don't understand that there's strong scientific consensus among the climate science community on global warming and the human-driven nature of this change. We know that the anatomy of a good message, as I've already articulated, includes an emotional appeal. This is some of that per could be something about a personal connection. It's logical and relevant, right? It's connecting to place and context. Um, it's connecting people with things that they care about and is using emotion. There are lots of great books you can read that will inform um, your technique or tactics if you want. This is a great one, Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath. Um, and they have this success framework um, for effective messaging, which includes things that are simple, having elements of your conversation that are unexpected, provide credible knowledge, cred come from credible sources, concrete, emotional, and I think you'll, you hear this often probably, or, or do this yourselves, is think about stories and narratives. Um, when we unpack this specifically to climate change, this is the five pieces of evidence-based messaging around climate change, again, from my colleague Ed Maybach at George Mason University, which simply states, it's real, it's us, scientists agree, it's bad, there's hope, but there's no time to waste. And so I added that last little piece. There's hope is the last of those, um, this sort of climate change communication, um, evidence-based messaging that we can use. So this is a great framework. If you could memorize these five pieces, um, you can structure your conversations around these. We know that there's several messages that work. Climate change is a threat multiplier. Climate change is not bringing anything, to, anything new. It's amplifying um, events we've already experienced, making them more frequent, more extreme. Um, connecting to people's um, lived environment, right? Our society infrastructure are based on the premise of a stable climate. Um, we make assumptions every day. This is getting at uncertainty pieces. Um, so we know there are many messages that work when incorporated in, into a conversation um, in a way that's effective. Um, it's important if we wanna understand who we're talking to and stepping away from that deficit model into the dialogue uh, model of communication is that we actually have to be active listeners and we need to do that from a space of open-mindedness and non-judgment. This is very difficult. Um, I fall into this trap all the time. Um, I get a lot of emails from people challenging me, challenging the science that my organization does. And I often have to take a space, take a minute and read and listen from a place of understanding and trying to, to not judge where someone is coming from, but see where um, their concerns or maybe misunderstanding are, are the origins of that. We need to tell stories of action and change. I'm sure many of you have those. I think you yourselves are probably those stories of action and change, and you shouldn't shy away from telling those. Um, this is a story of an action and change that uh, my colleagues often share. Um, uh, for those of you who are uh, in Seattle, um, Seattle Public Utilities is partnering with King County right now. Um, and because of some very clever, smart engineers who are paying attention to the world through a climate lens, um, they're actually building a tunnel. It's called the Ship Canal Water Quality Project in Seattle right now. It should be um, online in the year 2025, but they're already uh, designing this tunnel to help manage um, stormwater and wastewater. Um, and because some engineers flagged that the um, variables they were using to account for future precipitation were, were insufficient, they actually upsized this tunnel from 14 feet diameter to 18 feet in diameter, um, nearly doubling the capacity of stormwater and wastewater that this tunnel can hold, ensuring that it will be far more resilient to the changes in future extreme precipitation we expect in the region. And this literally was because a couple of people flagged the issue and it went up the chain to leadership who was willing to have this conversation and make a climate smart investment. So there are these stories hidden everywhere and we should make them unhidden. Um, we see a desire for action at all levels of government. So again, contrary to what we might think, this I think is a hopeful piece. A majority of people want to see our federal, state, and local governments doing more. So people's actions or phone calls or votes aren't for naught. 56% um, of adults in Washington want local officials to do more to address climate change. I think we can tick up this number, but that's more than I thought. And 64% want, want local citizens to do more, right? So this is where the personal and the professional can blend together and we can be getting more and more people engaged in action-oriented work around climate change. 
unfortunately for us, and many of you might represent some of these organizations, this isn't a complete list, um, but the Northwest leads the nation in its the breadth and depth of work and attention to, um, going towards building climate resilience, and this is occurring at all levels of governance. So those positive stories, those places where change can occur, are plentiful in our region. And so these are ways that we can think about in our professional capacities, having conversations, or even simply acknowledging the work that's already being done. Um, gratitude is a great way to inspire more work and to get people doing more than what more of the good things we want them doing. So acknowledging the things we see that are being done well, rather than just pointing out the things that need to be done better. And there are certainly a lot of those, um, but there are a lot of um, things that are, are being done well now and often by individuals who deserve our gratitude. So again, simple, clear messages repeated often, by a variety of trusted voices. This is very, very simple. I know it's um, you're probably rolling your eyes. It's, uh, I understand from this long practice that I've engaged in, and look, I will continue to gauge, engage in, in climate communication. This is, seems too simple to be true, um, but I think it's these things that we can grasp onto ourselves when we think about this, these, the numerous challenges of climate change communication. Um, and I'll end with this piece and that um, when we communicate about climate change, no matter the context, um, it's often a journey <laughs> with no end. And it requires us to constantly reflect on what we're doing, why we're doing it, thinking about the, our audience, um, thinking about what we're, is working well, asking, so putting ourselves in a place where we are the listeners rather than the givers <laughs> of information or knowledge, and then repeating that on loop. And so this will always be a practice. This is something that um, we all should be engaging in more. Um, and there will be difficult conversations and some of them won't go well. But if we don't start having these conversations, there's no way that we um, are going to achieve what we need to as far as our policy targets and our adaptation targets um, if we don't start having these important conversations. And we can simply do that by um, having more conversations with our family and friends. And for those of you who said you do it all the time, let's think about who else you might be reaching or might be connecting with and having these conversations. And so I will stop there um, with about 10 minutes for questions. But again, um, the moderators can make sure we have time. Um, but feel free to email me, you can find me on Twitter. Um, I actually will soon be departing the Pacific Northwest um, to go work on climate resilience um, in the Midwest at the University of Minnesota, but I will. St I am still reachable by um, all forms of technology. So um, I'll end there and um, can hopefully take some questions. Thank you so much, Heidi. I learned a ton. And I think Jan is going to be the best one to monitor questions. Um, I really, I really got a lot out of that presentation. And one of the concepts that struck me was that I always hear that, you know, the greatest uncertainty when we're talking about climate change being um, that uncertainty in the science. Um, but really sort of changing that dialogue a little bit and saying, no, the science is clear. The uncertainty is the human behavior and action. That was really um, interesting to hear it framed that way. Um, so Jan, do we have questions coming in for Heidi? I um, have one question here. It says, could Heidi share more of her campaigns and materials where she had measurable results of audience attitude change? Uh, let's see, uh, off the top of my head, I don't want to misrepresent anything. Um, so yeah, that can be uh, difficult to track, particul particularly in a longitudinal fashion. Um, I'm trying to think of concrete examples. Well, um, I do a lot of, and so these would be, for, on a scientific perspective, would be more anecdotal uh, because they're not longitudinal, but uh, I do trainings, both climate communication as well as like climate adaptation um, around the country, um, particularly in the water sector. So with water utilities, water managers, um, and we actually do a communication of client. I mean, I wish we were all in person together because this would have been more workshop oriented. And so we could have um, actually had you practice some of your own messaging for your own context, your own audiences. Um, but we have seen, um, 
I guess I'm gonna give you one anecdote in the spirit of time um, where we have a concrete uh, impact is that I actually was hired to conduct focus groups about climate change information use across water utilities in the US. And we very simply asked um, if people were taught where they access climate change information, if at all, where they had information within their um, organizations or externally, sort of who were their trusted messengers. Um, and I actually went and did these focus groups around the country. And I can, and pretty much every instance, just the pure act of me, in that case, a neutral party showing up and asking five simple questions about the first one was literally what climate impacts do you think will impact your job function within this utility? Um, these simple focus groups were the first time in many instances that a organization, people with across an organization, both laterally and vertically, were having a conversation about the relevance of climate change to their fu job functions and to their organizations. And so in that case, this was a great example of the pure act of having a conversation was a way to move the dial. And once that conversation, that seed was planted, in many of these organizations, in, in what we would characteristically define as um, very conservative places, climate change became a narrative, um, became part of their narrative, um, again, both vertically and laterally in their organization. And that was simply the act of me showing up and asking some climate change related questions, being completely neutral. I didn't know left from right in these organizations. I had no um, bias or anything. I didn't have any preconceived outcome that I wanted. And we heard again and again and again that it was the catalyst that was needed to start these conversations. And so that's an anecdote. Um, we'll hopefully be publishing the package of results from those surveys. And we're actually conducting a follow on to that now with the Water Research Foundation across Pacific Northwest utilities um, in Oregon, Idaho, and Washington. So we'll be learning more and facilitating these conversations further. So that's just an, one example. Thank you, Heidi. We have a couple more questions here. Um, this one is for from Dana. She asks, what do you do with claims that past predictions have been incorrect? Um, past model projections? I guess we probably don't have time. I can just... Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so actually, when we look at, for example, the climate impacts groups, um, projections from... Um, we've been around this is june marks our 25th anniversary um the the numbers have not changed by enough that would have warranted someone not making a decision um and this is true across a range of examples so that is to say that um the narrowing of uncertainty around our projections um for most cases has been small enough that um it wouldn't have if you had made a decision using that information, um, you likely would not be <laughs> um, feeling badly about that, that preparation that you've done. So there's certainly uncertainty around climate projections. Um, when we think about climate information use in planning and making decisions using climate change information, it really is about um, risk and risk tolerance. And these are very institutionally specific conversations. Um, and so that is often, the context I find myself in is actually facilitating conversations around like how much risk are we willing to assume? And that is also based on a decision decision co um, context, right? So when we think about using, uh, and it depends on the type of climate projection you're using. If you're looking at temperature versus say stream flow, there's different amounts of uncertainty that go into those projections and how it's been say downscaled to a region. And so we do really do work to help facilitate people's understanding of the source of the uncertainty, um, but also that it is not a reason to not act. So, and, and how much risk you assume, again, is, is a very decision, um, spe decision specific um, issue, but something we work to facilitate. Okay, we have another one here from Clifford. He says, what sorts of policy efforts are there that you're aware of in agriculture? We know that conventional ag is a major contributor to emissions, but as a beginning producer, I often feel that I need to raise capital outside of traditional methods because funds are conditional to conventional ag techniques, practices, and expectations. Yeah, and that's a really good point. I'm I'm not an expert in that space, and so I um, 
might punt this. My colleague's probably not on the phone, but Chad Kruger is giving a talk in the same session, and he would probably be able to give you a better answer because he is actively working, um, particularly in the state of Washington, at the state level um, to to really advance um, the climate climate space around around agriculture and sort of conventional versus organic agriculture. So that's a really good question, and I don't have specific policy. Um, policies for you but if you wanted to send me an email I'd be happy to try to connect you with colleagues or resources or do some digging um, to connect you with some information that might be useful so I'm sorry I don't have an answer for you off off the top of my head but I'd be happy to help dig around and get you some information yeah thank you that's a good point we'll have everybody's all the presenters um, contact information so if you think of something later you can always reach out to them uh, directly as well I do have one uh, last question here, and this is from Levi. He says, is there any evidence that linking climate change effects to local and regional economies results in a more willingness to pay for adaptation among citizens? For example, you mentioned that folks are willing to pay $1, but not 40. Yeah, and I um, don't have a specific study that I could point to to tell you an answer one way or the other. Um, there are some interesting things that we could unpack in the state of Washington, particularly around the carbon fee initiatives um, um, that have failed for various reasons. There's some really great writing on, um, on those ballot initiatives and why they were unsuccessful. Um, and, and part of that had to do with fee structures and lack of trust in government, um, as I understand it. So lack of trust in say fees being used to do the things say the state government agencies said they were going to do. Um, so there, there are some interesting things within the state of Washington um, that we could unpack that people have been studying um, to look at understanding that, but I can't point to a specific study that has looked explicitly at that.